In this video, we're going to talk about change management and dig into how you actually do it. You may not be an expert after watching this video, but you will certainly have some more insight. Let's get going right now. Hi there, I'm Andrea Adams and the host of HR Shop Talk. On this show, you get expert insight into all things HR. I encourage you to subscribe to the show by clicking on the button at the bottom of the screen, or you can subscribe to the podcast to keep learning from my smart and experienced guests. Today's guest is Cindy Manuel. Cindy's been a change management professional for over 10 years. She partners with her clients to demystify and change and support them through the peaks and valleys of the transition. Before getting into change management, she had been an HR professional for 15 years, so she recognizes the important link between change management and HR. Today, Cindy's an organizational change management director for a consulting firm in Denver, and she's ProSci certified. We're glad to have her. Hi, Cindy, how are you? Hi, Andrea, good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, and I'm looking forward to digging into this some more with you. So in the last episode, um, we talked about the models of change management, but I'm going to ask the question again. What are those models and which one do you use? Great. Um, well, I think if you looked up change management on Google, several would come up, probably yes. 20 or 30. <laughs> so um, these are just some that I feel are very beneficial. The first one is Cotter's model, which is the eight steps of change. So, you know, it's a, a sense of urgency making sure that you have a change management team, um, focusing on short-term goals, reinforcing the new behaviors on the back end. So that's a good one. Another one that you've probably heard of is the Kubler-Ross change curve. And this model is really beneficial when people are going through changes where they might be on a bit of a, an emotional roller coaster. Mm -hmm. You've probably heard of these stages before, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Mm -hmm. People can be at any different phase at any given time, but it really just sort of gives a good frame of reference for where people might be when they're having to let go of something. And then the one that I work with the most and like the most, uh, for me anyway, is the ProSci ADCAR model. Um, and that's E-A-D-K-A-R, that's mm -hmm. their model. ProSci is the name of the organization. Um, and A stands for awareness, D stands for desire, K stands for knowledge, A stands for ability, and R stands for reinforcement. And I find this model is a really beneficial model. It builds, each letter sort of builds on the last one. Um, if you don't have awareness, you're not gonna get to desire. Um, desire is sort of the what's in it for me. If you mm -hmm. don't know something's coming, you certainly aren't going to be focused on what's in it for me. You're going to be asking why. Why is this happening? Um, so each step sort of builds on the last, which is great. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, ProSci does a lot of uh, webinars and things around their ad car model. But I found it very, very impactful for the changes that I've been on. So can we talk about one of the models and talk about how each of the letters um, or the phases of change um, drive activity on the part of a change manager, somebody managing the change? Definitely. So um, there, the phases of change, and, and that's something that's sort of common throughout um, most of the change management models, there's typically three phases of change. You prepare for the change, you make the change, you reinforce the change or sustain the change long term. So in preparing for the change, that's where awareness starts coming in. You want to start to build awareness. So the way that I approach that is um, I start to do things like surveying my, my stakeholders to see, you know, how, did, how have previous changes gone over? what worked well, maybe what didn't work well, so that I can sort of take those lessons learned um, and, and use that as an approach to use leverage what worked and maybe leverage what didn't work. Mm -hmm. I then start to meet with people and put together a good strategic change management strategy, a communications plan, and a training plan. And once I've done that, then I start to have a regular cadence of, of calls with 
my counterpart. So if it's an HR individual, it would be your change management people and your HR people to start talking about, okay, who are our stakeholders and how are they going to be impacted? This is where desire comes in. Because if people are going to be impacted in different ways, which they typically are, my employees are going to be impacted one way and maybe even a subset of my employees. My managers are going to be impacted in a different way. HR might be another stakeholder group. They're going to be impacted in a different way. So I want to look at desire, what's in it for each of those groups, and I want to build communications around that so that they understand what's coming, why is it coming, what's in it for them, what can they expect, who can they go to to ask questions, things like that. The other thing that I do during desire is I like to start to look at across the organization and see who are our change champions, who are the people You've got that change curve, and typically you've got people who are early adopters on one side of the change curve. You have people who are laggards who are at the very other end or extreme of the change curve, and then you have people who are at any given place in between those two. Mm -hmm. So I look for my early adopters, and I ask them if they would be willing to be change champions for this change um, so that we can involve them in looking at communications in participating in training early, um, but that they will be really key to helping other their peers through this change because they already see the vision. We want people, other people to see the vision as well. Hmm. So that's part of desire also. And then you move into knowledge. And knowledge is all around, you know, typically around training. How am I going to do this new uh, behavior or use this new solution or um, any number of things. I need to be trained on what my future state is going to look like. Can I ask a question related to the training? Training often, you know, on a system would be part of the project plan, but you're talking about it in terms of change management. Where does it belong? It could belong to either, honestly. Okay. In most organizations, whether it's a part of the project plan or a part of change management, change management aligns very, very closely with training. Okay. It's, they're both focused around the people, so they should be very closely aligned. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and they're both are a part of the project, honestly, but just the focus is on the people side of the change as opposed to the project itself. Right. Yeah. Then um, on to the second A of ADCAR. Yeah, so um, that is all around ability. So um, that's where I really start to tap into middle managers who are going to be there to support, encourage, and gently nudge their employees towards this change. Same thing with HR. HR is a huge part of that ability um, to make sure that people feel comfortable, that they know, you know, you've now been trained in what these new behaviors are going to be, but now you need to actually go out and do it and try it. And what we eventually want people to do is to stop paying attention to the change, honestly. We want it to stop being disruptive to them so that they just go about their jobs is the reason that they're there in the first place and they no longer pay attention to this change. And then at the end, we look at uh, reinforcement. So once we have gone through whatever the change is, we want to continue to take a look at how are people adopting this new change? Are they doing okay? Um, do we need to incorporate more more communication? Do we need to incorporate more training? Um, do we need our change champions to meet with people one on one to sit with them and say, you know, let me sort of sit with you and help you through this change a little bit further, or your managers or HR as well. Um, and then we want them to sort of follow up every maybe 30, 60, 90 days to just check in and make sure that the change sticks. And then one thing that sort of is woven throughout the entire project is we really need leadership support. We want to make sure that there's a sponsor, an overarching sponsor of the change from a leadership perspective, but that that person also has an aligned um, leadership uh, coalition with them so that all the leaders across the organization are not just nodding their heads that they're going forward with this change, but they're actually engaged with the employees and helping them through this. Can you talk about the change management plan and what, presumably you have something written down, what does that look like? Absolutely. So um, initially 
we do uh, we like to do an organizational readiness assessment with with people so for HR this would be really good too and ideally it's you know you sit down with people or you could do a very brief survey about how have changes happened in the past what worked really well what didn't work really well you sort of capture all of that information and then you start to you know you meet with people who may be involved with things like communications things like training and that may or may not be a part of your HR department um, but you know of course HR is really critical to have at the table as well again because they have their finger on the pulse so you get together with that group of people as well um, also the leader whomever came up with the idea of the change it's always really beneficial to meet with that person too to get their vision and then you do you start to put together a change management um, strategy typically which is sort of the overarching recommendations based on communications based on engagement based on training based on reinforcement what are the things that we want to do? What are the activities that we want to do? And then from there, you build out, I call it a change management roadmap, but um, it's sort of a week by week. Here are the communications we're going to work on. Here's when those communications are going to be sent out to each of those stakeholder groups. Um, here's when training is going to occur. Here's when we're going to uh, identify, engage, and onboard, onboard our change champion network. Here's when we're going to, um, you know, go live. So here's when we're then going to do a reinforcement workshop on the back end and put that plan together. So you've got a whole list of activities. You have owners and you're able to week by week see what you need to do. Uh, that's really, you know, that's kind of where the tactical process comes into place. You have all the planning, then you execute upon it, and then you have the reinforcement on the back end. If you found this enlightening, subscribe to see all the episodes and comment. What change management model are you familiar with and how does it work for you? Tell us in the comment section below. So in my experience, there's often a lot of anxiety about the resistors, the people who are going to resist the change. Um, what do you tell your clients about those people? I knew you were going to ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> because they always ask. It's a great question, and you're absolutely right. That is one of the top questions, and that's when it. And I understand because it's where things go off the rails mm -hmm. is when you have resistance, right? But it's human nature. So I think one of the first things I always tell uh, my clients is let's expect it, and let's identify based on history where we might proactively be able to identify it. Where have we seen resistance in the past? And maybe it's not downright resistance. Maybe it's just some hesitation. Mm -hmm. And then the next step that I, I uh, recommend sometimes causes my clients to sort of scratch their heads. But I always say, let's invite some of them to the table. Let's talk to them. Instead of saying, you know, conflict, I don't want to deal with it. Let's invite them to the table. Let's ask them questions. What are the concerns that you might have? What are some of the things that you think we should consider as we move forward with this change? There have been many, many times where we have aha moments because we've invited those resistors to the table. They provide insight that we may have not considered previously. And then as a result of that, they feel heard. We have a better holistic view of what's coming and what could potentially, maybe they might get hung up on. And many, many times I see them turn around to be adopters and champions of the change. So if you do it all right, you can actually turn them around and then they become your most passionate change champions. And that would be so powerful for the rest of you. Very powerful. Especially if people know, gosh, Andrea typically does not go for all these changes, but look, she's she's fully on board. So guess what? I'm gonna fully get on board as well. Right. Okay. Um, I've also heard around this resistance that there's a 90-10 rule, or maybe it's an 80-20 rule, where 80% will sort of go along with it and 20% will resist. Um, in your experience, is that true? You know, I there's a change curve you're probably familiar with. Yeah. And on that change curve, and I've seen various models of this too, but at the most simple level, you typically have about 15 to 20 percent of your organization who says, "Yep, let's go for this thing. Let's do it." Those are your early adopters. You usually have 15 percent, maybe 20 percent on the exact opposite end of that spectrum, who are your laggards. 
um, not unusual either. And then you have people all along that continuum. And what I always recommend to people is while you might feel like you should focus on your laggards, if you actually focus on the people who are somewhere in between and pull them along, mm -hmm. a lot of times your laggards are going to come along too, for, sometimes for the sheer fact of, I don't want to be the only one who is resisting this change. So here's a question for you. What do organizations overlook most often in change management? If I could you know, sort of sum it up, I think in incorporating your leaders, and I've mentioned this before, but I think incorporating your leaders in the change, really hearing what their vision is, especially whoever made this decision to change, really listen to what their vision is and listen to the why they think that this is a good change for the organization so that you can help to put some mess messaging around that um, and to start to build your change management strategy. Honestly, it begins with the why. Why are we doing this? Also, again, looking at your middle managers who are so critical, so key, because they hear the vision and communicate that across the organization at all levels. Um, and honestly, if there's a change happening, the person I want to hear it from is the person that I report into. I'm also going to give the most feedback to the person I report into. So they play a really critical role. So really paying attention to them as well. Um, I also think tapping into HR, they're a really great advocate. If they aren't um, a part of the change, they typically have their finger on the pulse if they're an HR business partner for a various um, area of the organization. They're going to know some of the people who might be resistant or hesitant or nervous. They're also going to know people who are going to be early adopters excited. Um, they're going to know how people prefer to be communicated with. They're going to know how people prefer to be trained. All of that good information you know, good HR business partners are going to have that knowledge. So definitely want you all to be engaged in those conversations. Yeah. And then um, just the reinforcement on the back end, I think is something that a lot of organizations overlook. They sort of say, all right, we're done. Um, but, you know, you want to make sure that we sort of stick to that change. Right. So related to that, when is change management done? Uh, you know, when you're consulting to a client, when, when is the relationship with that client over? Yeah, I mean, typically when a little bit after a project goes live, when we do a reinforcement workshop and, okay. you know, we put a plan together and then we turn it over to them. Um, but a lot of times clients stay in touch with us to be mm -hmm. able to say things went really well or when are you coming back or if we've done our jobs right, you know, hopefully that's the case. Thanks, Cindy. That was great. I especially pre appreciated the clear overview of the steps of change management. It's certainly filled in some gaps for me. Um, you may be interested in watching an episode on crisis management in HR, which has some parallels to this conversation. Check that out here. Thanks for watching and see you next time.